roundabout ribbons of concrete and asphalt. They conquer terrain, heights, and the worst traffic in the world. Multi-level and multimodal. They're the longest structures on Earth. Yet we tear them down and rebuild them. Bigger, taller, and quieter. It's time to take a spin. Now, the untold story of superhighways on Modern Marvels. Sneaking across valleys. Tunneling through mountains. Towering over cities. The world's superhighways dominate the Earth's landscape. Superhighways are the greatest single structures in the world. They are enormously wide. They sometimes take up a thousand feet of right of way. They have multiple lanes and occasionally multi modes, but always you find tens of thousands of vehicles rushing along these roads every single day. Sometimes 500,000 vehicles will travel over one spot on a superhighway. No superhighway in the world can match the size and scope of America's U.S. interstate system. This immense network of highways consists of 55,000 bridges, 100 tunnels, and a staggering 46,000 miles of concrete and asphalt. Stretched from end to end, it's long enough to circle the Earth almost twice. And in Texas, a state where everything is supersized, America's superhighway is getting even bigger. In 2003, engineers began a $2.8 billion facelift of Interstate 10, a slice of freeway connecting the bedroom community of Katy to downtown Houston. 500,000 motorists navigate through this corridor each day. That's roughly 10 times more than when it opened in 1960. In response, engineers are crafting a 23-mile makeover to quicken the commutes of drivers heading to and from the fourth largest city in America. Starting in Katy and heading east to downtown Houston, I-10 bisects two beltways, Highway 8 and I-610. The corridor's narrowest sections hold 11 lanes of traffic. I-10's multi-billion dollar makeover will add two toll lanes in each direction as well as two additional main lanes and one frontage lane heading west, mirrored by the same additions heading east. The final stretch of superhighway will be 20 lanes wide. It's a $100 million a mile undertaking that runs 24-7. And at mile 17 of the project, paving the new westbound frontage lane is underway. Meet the slip form paver a multitasking mechanical workhorse that's the quintessential sculptor of the world's superhighways. To pave this road, we have dump trucks which come in, they'll dump their loads of concrete in front of the paver, and then the paver will spread that concrete. As the slip form paver reaches the freshly dumped concrete, a set of augered teeth spreads it evenly across the width of the paver's mouth. Vibrators in the paver's steel belly then consolidate the concrete into a homogeneous mass. On the opposite end, the paver's automated tail smooths the concrete lane, giving it a glossy finish. After the wet concrete is polished, a machine combs grooves into the surface. The grooves will channel away water when it rains. Crews also create a rough texture that enables the tires of your car to grip the road. 1,500 feet of new road will be paved tonight. But this new frontage road will need to cure for seven days before it can open to traffic. Farther down the corridor, workers are addressing an expensive problem. Because of the new added lanes, the original interchanges no longer line up with the main lanes. They must be destroyed and rebuilt. Okay. Working over 100 feet above the ground, operators use blow torches to slice through the three inch thick steel beams, which once supported the concrete roadbed. Each beam weighs about a million pounds. You gotta be careful. This is dangerous right here, you know. 
To protect motorists from flying debris, workers have closed lanes adjacent to the demolition site. But in just four hours, they'll have to reopen them for the morning rush hour, leaving a narrow window for the crew to finish its work. The rest of the operation is going to go back tomorrow night. We're going to all over start in the same processing to cut in, bringing it down and hauling it from the job site. Although it may not look like it, the entire 23-mile project is 80% finished, with construction expected to end within one year. The revamped highway is designed to absorb traffic increases through the corridor for the next two decades. Once a sleepy farm town, Houston is now testament to the explosive growth generated by America's superhighway over the past half century. It all began in 1956, when President Dwight D. Eisenhower envisioned what would become the largest public works program in the history of the world. In a span of 40 years, construction crews moved 42 billion cubic yards of earth, 10 times more than the volume extracted to create the Panama Canal. Workers detonated 1 billion pounds of explosives, mixed 2.3 billion tons of cement, and placed millions of miles of steel rebar. When the project was finally finished in 2007 with Boston's Big Dig, they poured enough concrete to construct a wall nine feet thick and 50 feet high around the world. The landscape of America was forever changed. America is a great nation because of its highways. It does not have highways because it's a great nation. These highways make it what it is. They make it wealthy, they make it powerful, well, they make it quick. Today, motorists can reach the four corners of the United States by following numbered red, white, and blue shields. Odd interstate numbers run north and south, with the larger numbers in the east and the smaller numbers in the west. East-west routes have even-numbered designations, with the larger numbers in the north and the smaller numbers in the south. In addition to these four transcontinental routes, there are an additional 209 interstate highways that web out across America's interior. While the U.S. interstate unifies the country, it also serves its intended purpose as a military defense network. Dwight Eisenhower obsessed about a nuclear holocaust. It plagued him. And one of the things he wanted to do was deliver the interstate system, a superhighway network that would allow people, after a nuclear strike, to evacuate a city and then begin the rebuilding along those very roads that they evacuated on. Eisenhower's worst fears never came to pass. But his interstate network has helped protect America in some of its darkest days. September 11, 2001, all the planes around the United States were grounded. What sustained us through that attack was the U.S. interstate system. Trucks were sent to the airports. Precious cargoes were unloaded from the bellies of the planes. And life continued along the interstate system. And when Hurricane Katrina struck the Gulf Coast in 2005, over a million displaced residents found a path to safety along America's superhighways. While the connectivity of America's interstate system helps protect the masses, it's also created massive sprawl. The interstate system is a victim of its own success. It connects neighborhoods and cities, but when it passes through a densely populated neighborhood, it creates a lot of noise. Surprisingly, the largest noise polluter isn't car engines. It's car tires. 75% of highway noise is a result of tires rolling over the pavement. The noise generates when tires push out air trapped beneath them, when they slip or stick to the road, or when they create suction with a road surface. Erecting sound barrier walls is one solution to dampen noise. But since they cost a million dollars a mile, the search continues for alternatives. Engineers at Purdue University are providing one with so-called quiet pavement. The rubber hits the road literally 
along this ring-shaped spinning treadmill. We put two microphones next to the tire and actually drive then across the road and, and measure how uh, loud that particular pavement is. The machine will go up to 30 miles an hour, and that's one revolution a second. It's a pretty scary machine. I wouldn't be standing here with the machine going 30 miles an hour. Safety reasons dictate the 30 mile per hour limit, but the recorded decibel levels are adjusted to represent noise at interstate speeds. To discover what types of road surface dampens car noise most effectively, Purdue's researchers test a variety of textured asphalt and concrete pavements. This pavement has texture to the surface, which gives channels for the air to escape. And the clapping mechanism, when the tire tread hits the pavement, there's air that would be compressed in a normal pavement. In this pavement, it has a way to escape and get away from the tire. During testing, the operator cranks up the machine slowly to avoid any mishaps. Okay, we're going up to 20 miles an hour, and I'm watching for anything flying off the machine. At 30 miles an hour, depending on the weight of the object, it could come through the wall. If, if we lost that whole tire, that would be a good example. So, just how quiet is quiet pavement? There have been some recent studies where they've done surveys of, of a lot of the pavements in the, in the country. And they've measured everything from about 103 decibels up to about 113 decibels. When we've been doing the quieter alternative, we're getting them from anywhere from about 104 decibels down to about 98 decibels. Although it may not seem like much, that's enough for a driver to notice. Loud or quiet, America's interstate system is the gold standard for superhighways throughout the world. For now, 5,000 miles away, the most densely populated nation in the world is paving its way towards supremacy. Today in China, it's like 1960 in America. They are building great, great stretches of road. There are 25,000 miles of these superhighways in China today. 400 million people have been lifted out of poverty. All of a sudden now, China is the world's factory. And along these interstate systems that they're building, they are shipping goods to ports and deploying them across the country and the world. Today, China's ambitious superhighway network is still a work in progress. But plans call for it to expand dramatically over the next decade. And since China now makes 7 million cars each year, it can expect its share of gridlock. If China's national highway trunk system looks a lot like the U.S. interstate system, there's a good reason. They have almost copied exactly the U.S. interstate system. The color of the signs, the, the feel and the texture of the road. The only real difference is in China, they've improved on the interstate system. The travel lanes are a little bit wider for trucks. In China, the superhighways are unapologetically built for the economy. In China's economic capital, the densely populated city of Shanghai, Chinese engineers have designed an extreme version of an American superhighway that's also uniquely Asian. Encircling Shanghai are three beltways, or ring roads. Nine expressways bisect the beltways, leading into the city. The fluid design allows drivers to enter different spur roads should one become too congested. And that's almost a certainty, because roughly two million drivers commute along the Shanghai Expressway each day. China's superhighway system is expanding roughly 3,000 miles every year. At its current pace, it will eclipse the 46,000-mile U.S. interstate system by 2017. No matter who sits atop the superhighway throne, expansion must continue to keep pace with driver demand. And while some expansion projects add or widen lanes, 
Others build from the ground up. Way up. From the sky, their designs can appear simple, majestic, even chaotic. Yet these curving and roundabout ribbons of superhighway all perform an essential role, enabling motorists to change course in a variety of directions without stopping. Interchanges are an intersection on steroids. If you think about an interchange, it is a massive organization of sometimes 16 lanes of highway coming together at 70, 80 miles an hour where people are not touching their brakes, they're just flying through it. Kind of like a, a needle and a thread weaving through a complex textile. There are 14,750 interchanges along the U.S. Interstate Superhighway. This one in Riverside, California, has developed into a traffic choke point, and engineers are in the process of improving it. Currently, we're standing on top of a southwest connector ramp, which is elevated approximately 80 feet above the main line of traffic below. This particular interchange has three freeways that encompass it. They will take people to L.A., it'll take people to Orange County, it'll take people to Vegas, it'll also take people to Palm Springs and to San Diego. 300,000 commuters pass through this cloverleaf interchange each day. The dense volume of traffic has exposed a key design weakness common to this configuration. On a cloverleaf, you have two patterns of traffic merging in the same space. One flow of traffic is trying to merge onto the freeway, and in the same section of roadway, another stream of traffic is trying to merge off the freeway. Since the initial construction of America's first major highways decades ago, increased traffic volume has forced the hand of state engineers to design more elaborate interchanges. There are three generations of interchanges. The first was the rotary, this large circle that allowed traffic from different directions to merge. The next generation was the cloverleaf. From the air, it looked like four different rotaries in one intersection. The third generation of interchange is filled with flyovers. Flyover interchanges allow motorists to change direction along their own dedicated ramp, eliminating the need to merge with traffic exiting the highway. In densely populated areas like Riverside, interchange designers are building up to maximize sparse real estate. And in Texas, they've gone to breathtaking new heights. This interchange towers 12 stories above the ground and occupies 251 acres of land. It's a one-of-a-kind five-level flyover, the Dallas High Five. The high stacks on the High Five are up to 120 feet in the air. And that can be sort of frightening to a driver that hasn't experienced that before. Let's take a closer look at this immense web of concrete and steel. On the first level, you'll find the north and southbound lanes for US 75. The second stack holds frontage roads on each side of the four directional interchange. The third stack contains the east and westbound lanes for I-635. The fourth and fifth stacks are the direct connector ramps between I-635 and US-75. To build this massive interchange, workers mixed 350,000 cubic yards of concrete, planted 710 bridge columns, placed 31 miles of bridge beams, and poured 2 million square feet of bridge deck. Yet the greatest challenge for engineers was constructing the High Five over the footprint of the old interchange without turning the highway into a parking lot. I would compare it to living in your house and building a new house around the house while you're living in it. Now, it's insane, but that's what we had to do. Placing the High Five support piers and columns was the crew's first order of business. Drivers hauled large precast segments from a neighboring casting yard to the construction site. Erecting them conventionally using large cranes would have taken up too large a footprint in the confined work area. So engineers relied on the brute strength of an Italian import. The contractor came up with an innovative idea 
to build a special piece of equipment we called Sergio. Sergio was a segment erector to take the segments of precast and load them up onto the bridge. And this required very little manpower, basically, to get it done. Safely attached to the top of the bridge pier, Sergio hoisted the 75-ton concrete segments into position. After Sergio lifts a segment, it rotates it on its axis, moves it laterally, then lowers it into position. Then workers secure the segment to the existing bridge pier. After four years of construction, the $270 million Dallas High Five officially opened in December 2005, one year ahead of schedule. Today, it's far more than just a towering interchange. The High Five is basically a landmark. In fact, it's a destination for tourists to the area. So we have individuals that are becoming famous for taking photographs of the interchange. It's on the cover right now of the Dallas uh, telephone book. And don't be surprised if similar colossal interchanges start popping up in other densely populated cities across America. Unfortunately, it may be even bigger in the future for some of these other projects. And if people are scared about the high five now, I can't imagine what they're going to say when it's high seven or high nine. They might just start selling tickets. While stack interchanges help keep traffic flowing, grueling commutes still plague America's superhighway. One motorist finally lowered the boom on a bridge that bedeviled him for years. The extraordinary success of America's superhighway comes at a price. The freedom to travel to the four corners of the country has created the largest car club in the world. People live in their cars, they commute in their cars, they vacation in their cars. Today, Americans are traveling further than they ever have to get from home to work. In the United States, 80% of adult Americans own a licensed car. That's 247 million drivers. And it's creating widespread traffic jams across the U.S. interstate system. You stay. Meet Dan Roofley, a battle-hardened road warrior who's about to embark on his morning commute. Like a lot of us, he hates the ritual, but he was destined to dish out some sweet revenge. My God, I've been driving this uh, commute for probably about 38 years. Dan's 45-mile commute from Akakik, Maryland, takes him along I-95 and the Woodrow Wilson Bridge. The Woodrow Wilson Bridge connects the states of Maryland and Virginia, spanning the Potomac River. Here, I-95 shrinks from four lanes to three and merges with several other roadway arteries, creating one of the worst traffic bottlenecks in America. To make matters worse, it's also one of the few drawbridges on the U.S. interstate system. Dan's frustration with the bridge hit a wall in 1999 during an especially painful morning commute. And I was going to work in one morning early, about 4.30 in the morning, and changed lanes and ran into the back of a tractor trailer that was parked half on the bridge then half on the shoulder. And when they, after the ambulance got me out and um, started to move to go across the bridge to come back to the hospital, moved about 50 feet, they opened the draw span of the bridge. And uh, from the time we started to move, it took probably about 45 minutes to an hour to get to the hospital. In 2006, after nearly four decades of commuter headaches, Dan finally got a chance to strike back. He was awarded the honor of blowing up his concrete nemesis by a multi-agency project created to rebuild the Woodrow Wilson Bridge. Today, the new dual span bridge is roughly 70% complete, enough to handle the daily traffic across the river. For Dan and the 200,000 other commuters that pass here each day, the future looks a lot wider. 
the new Woodrow Wilson Bridge will have six lanes in each direction, twice as many lanes as the old bridge. This will quadruple its daily capacity from 75,000 vehicles to 300,000. Yet for aesthetic reasons, it will remain a drawbridge. If we would have gone to a high bridge, it would have been 135 feet high over the middle of the river, and it would have been an eyesore compared to the rest of the monuments in downtown Washington, D.C. Sitting atop graceful arched piers, the new draw span towers 70 feet higher than its predecessor, which should decrease the number of openings by five times to about 50 per year. Erecting this new span of interstate requires huge amounts of concrete and steel. We have over 34 acres of bridge deck on this project, 2,500 miles of rebar in the deck, and over 80 million pounds of structural steel. While the southbound span of the bridge is nearly finished, it'll take another year to get the northbound span up and running. Still, the new bridge is already winning the praise of one of its harshest critics. It's still a bottleneck because of the other six lanes aren't open yet, but the openings has been a very big improvement on the traffic. While an open drawbridge will certainly put the brakes on your commute, a single distracted driver can have a surprisingly detrimental impact on a superhighway's ebb and flow. Just ask MIT engineers in Cambridge, Massachusetts, who've developed a sophisticated piece of civil engineering software that studies highway traffic patterns. Each vehicle here is characterized by certain uh, behavior patterns, like uh, how aggressive they are when they merge into lanes, how much of a desired speed that they would like to maintain, and the effect of all these individual behaviors is what you would see as the resulting traffic pattern on the network. Lowering the desired speed of one vehicle by half causes a dramatic rippling impact on traffic demonstrating how one distracted driver can clog a superhighway artery. So now we are zooming out a little bit to see what uh, impact that single slowdown vehicle had on the rest of the traffic. One distracted driver is all it takes to shut down the entire freeway. Real life traffic delays force American commuters to waste 4.2 billion hours a year in their vehicles. In the car mecca of the United States, Southern California, each driver spends an average of 72 hours a year sitting in traffic. Here at the Caltrans Traffic Management Center in Los Angeles, keeping vehicles moving is an unenviable task. We're trying to keep traffic moving in the, probably the most congested urban area in the world. We have 100 million vehicle miles driven every day. And that's like circumventing the, the, the globe 2,000 times. Using electronic sensors and electronic eyes, operators monitor for traffic accidents that can quickly tie up the system. This is one of our uh, closed circuit TV cameras here. Uh, this particular one is on the uh, 101 freeway in the Hollywood area. And as you can see, heading northbound on the 101, it's starting to get congested now. On a route like this, if a car were to break down, it's that much more important for us to get whatever the problem is out of the way there. As soon as operators discover a problem, the traffic management center disperses the appropriate response team. Speed is key. Each minute that a vehicle remains disabled in a lane creates seven minutes in traffic delays. While being stuck in traffic can be a drag, it's not quite as bad when you've got a view like this. These may be the most scenic superhighways in the world, but building them was anything but paradise. There's a good reason why so many of us find driving along the U.S. interstate system boring. From its straightaways, to its curves, to its signs, it's utterly predictable. But that's part of the secret of its success. No matter where you are in America, these interstate highway lanes are all the same. Four lanes of traffic at least, traveling in two different directions. 12-foot travel lanes, a 10-foot breakdown lane on your right, a 3-foot breakdown lane on your left. All of the signs are identical so that no matter where you are, 
your eye is trained to pick up what it needs to do. Before construction began on the U.S. interstate, drivers traveled on two-lane undivided highways. An ill-advised lane change could easily trigger a head-on collision. In the 1950s, there was an average of 50,000 driver fatalities per year. One of America's deadliest highways was Route 6, across Colorado's Rocky Mountains. These mountains were filled with precipitous drop-offs, sometimes thousand-foot cliffs with no guardrails. These roads were death waiting to happen. Today, motorists rely on the safer, more predictable Interstate 70 to carry them through these same mountains via the Eisenhower Tunnel. And then west across a grand section of superhighway, I-70 through Glenwood Canyon. The picturesque 12-mile stretch of I-70 features 40 massive bridges, three gigantic tunnels, and a sophisticated control center that's got its own private entrance. Yet perhaps its most spectacular engineering feat is how well it blends in with the grandeur of the landscape. This interstate looks like it sort of fell from the sky and somehow landed in the bottom of the canyon. When you're driving through, you see a lot of native plants. You also see a canyon that looks very natural. The seamless integration of such a colossal piece of infrastructure didn't happen by accident. It was a top priority for engineers when construction began in 1982. Their first task was deciding how to squeeze I-70's four lanes over the existing two-lane footprint of Route 6. The answer was to build an efficient split-level highway. That really became one of our primary design um, kind of constraints, was trying to stay within that disturbed area. And that terraced alignment concept allows us to put the westbound lane up on the upper deck, the eastbound lane on the lower deck, and then using retaining walls and squeezing it so that we could get it in that disturbed area. Wherever the highway threatened Glenwood Canyon's ecological treasures, engineers erected graceful viaducts using precast concrete segments. At a facility 20 miles away, workers poured the 36-ton segments. To lift them into place, engineers called upon a machine similar to the Dallas High 5 Sergio in order to protect the fragile floor of the canyon. The erection device we used was called an erection gantry. Well, the erection gantry is really a crane that sits up on the bridge, and what that did was it replaced a more conventional, like, crawler crane that would be sitting down on the ground underneath the bridge. Sitting atop a partially completed viaduct, the erection gantry hoisted the precast segment into place. Once in position, workers attached its bracketed edge to the bridge span, securing it with epoxy and steel tensioning rods. Once it was secured, the erection gantry repeated the process on the opposite side. There's a lot of benefit of being able to build these types of bridges from above so that you can protect the, the vegetation features underneath. And in this case, there's also an active stream underneath that wasn't touched at all as part of this construction. The meticulous construction of I-70 through Glenwood Canyon took 12 long years and $490 million to complete. Today, it provides motorists with safe passage through and stunning views of one of nature's greatest masterpieces. To discover a stretch of interstate that rivals the eco-friendly design of Glenwood Canyon, you'll have to travel thousands of miles across the Pacific Ocean to the Hawaiian island of Oahu. Here, the term interstate is a bit of a misnomer. So why on earth is it here? Now that's a question I've always gotten from everybody that I've spoken to. They say, that's an interstate highway, but it doesn't go to any other state. And I remind them that when President Dwight Eisenhower signed that interstate bill in, it was called, and still is, the Interstate and Defense Highway Network. The island of Oahu is home to all three of Hawaii's interstate highways. 
each carries its own unique interstate designation, H1, H2, and H3, a 16-mile, mostly elevated highway, linking the Honolulu area to the Kaneohe Marine Corps Air Base. H3 is arguably the most stunning superhighway in the world. But for workers, it was an arduous venture that pitted them against unforgiving terrain. Here, five miles west of Honolulu in the dense jungle of the Halava Valley, workers began construction on the $1.3 billion H3 in 1986. This whole valley was, as you see it here on the sides, nothing but trees. In fact, uh, we had a difficult time getting up. I had one of our engineers up there with the head bulldozer and he just pointed out which way he wanted them to go and they just bulldozed out the uh, vegetation. Since the valley was prone to flooding, engineers raised this portion of H3 onto a six mile long viaduct. Past the viaduct, H3's route hits the face of a massive obstacle the 3,000-foot-high Ko'olau mountain range. Here, engineers would have to tunnel through volcanic rock to construct H3's inbound and outbound twin tunnels. But hidden inside the mountain lurked a potential danger. Engineers were concerned that the heavy rainfall on this part of Oahu, which can total up to 200 inches a year, had left pockets of water trapped in the mountain. Accidentally drilling through one could cause a massive flood that would force engineers to change the tunnel's course. An exploratory tunnel was carved to determine a safe elevation for the twin bores. Today, it serves as a maintenance portal. Here we are in the exploratory bore off of the exploratory tunnel. And the main concern is water. There are dike compartments, very dense rock that is vertical and sometimes the water gets confined in this like a, a big standing pool of water. So when we're drilling a tunnel through this kind of geology, if we hit that water, we got a problem. To avoid trapped water pockets, engineers cut the nearly mile long tunnels along a 1,000 foot incline. Fortunately, they never found water. But as the tunnel empties out at its highest vantage point, Drivers discover a breathtaking view of the Haiku Valley along this majestic viaduct. And it's got beautiful curves in it. Uh, this particular section of the highway has won national and international awards. No matter where America's 46,000 miles of superhighways extend, an army of road warriors must learn how to cope with the chaos that can erupt on them at any time. And there's a lot more to their training method than fun and games. The rugged terrain of Oahu's North Halava Valley was so remote that helicopters carried surveyors to the H3 worksite. At the end of each day's work, the surveyors built a makeshift landing pad so they could be picked up. Superhighways will return on Modern Marvels, here on the History Channel. We now return to Superhighways on Modern Marvels. At least every three miles on America's superhighway is a familiar green and white sign directing drivers to their destinations. But when the interstate was first being designed, the sign's now famous color scheme was a point of contention. When they launched the construction of the interstate system, one federal highway administrator was in charge of picking out the colors of the signs. And he was bent on blue and white. But the problem was he was colorblind. He didn't know it, and no one who worked for him knew it. So they built a stretch of road, put people in cars on it, and let them pass through all these different colors of signs. The administrator was overruled overwhelmingly, and the signs are now green and white, thankfully, because we can see them much better at night. Today, the easily discernible green and white signs give drivers traveling at appropriate speeds 10 seconds to read and react, deterring them from making last-second lane changes that can trigger accidents. There are 2.5 million accidents each year on America's highways. And more than half occur in inclement weather. Many result from black ice, a thin layer of road ice that's virtually undetectable. But a new technology may soon change that. Cargill's Safe Lane is a revolutionary pavement overlay 
made of a sponge-like aggregate that can store any chemical de-icing compound. Applied on pavement in non-freezing temperatures, the de-icing chemical is released when temperatures drop below freezing, preventing the road from icing over. Of course, accidents occur in good weather too. And removing stricken vehicles safely from lanes rests on the shoulders of firefighters, policemen, EMTs, and tow truck drivers. They're called emergency first responders. Here at the University of Maryland Center for Advanced Transportation Technology, a one-of-a-kind first responder training simulation is in progress. This is communications. There is a multi-car accident on I-95 southbound at mile marker two. EMT support is requested. Here, we're training the folks that manage and operate the road to do their jobs in the most efficient manner to keep the traffic moving along the interstate system. I copy one priority one. What's the location of that patient? This first person simulation game may look like the latest video game release. But it's actually a sophisticated piece of traffic management software. Each person that plays the game has his own avatar that pulls them into the heart of the action. Both those patients you were just talking about, are they from this uh, black SUV here? By creating a realistic virtual traffic jam, first responders gain invaluable experience that before could only be learned on the job. Amidst all this virtual chaos, the goal of the simulation is clear. If they take too long to deal with the incident, they see the queues building up. If they do the right thing, they see traffic flowing better. They get a greater sense of how their actions affect the real world. This is communications. Tow trucks are on their way. Quickly clearing accident scenes and keeping traffic flowing not only saves America billions of dollars, but also helps prevent subsequent crashes at the site that could shut down the highway. Statistics have shown that for every one minute that a lane is blocked on the roadway, the chances of a secondary collision occurring goes up 3%. And oftentimes that secondary collision is far worse than the first collision. This simulation game is still in its early development stages. But these first responders already recognize its unique value as a training tool. In my first accident scene, I was definitely a little uh, nervous. Uh, was a little unsure. I think this tool would be great in any academy to have them go through these scenarios. That way they'll have the experience when they actually get out on the road and face these real life situations. Making the world's highways smarter, as well as the people that manage them, is just one factor that will keep traffic flowing smoothly in decades to come. The superhighways of tomorrow will be everything that our superhighways are today, but more more electronics, more lanes, more modes of transportation along those corridors, trains linking up with highways, linking up with seaports, and even airports to move goods to and from. As long as the gateway to economic prosperity is lined in concrete and asphalt, superhighways will continue to expand farther, stand taller, and stretch wider than any man-made structures in the world. <laughs>